you pleased and glad and happy and blessed at that reality that God so loved the world. In fact, that's the way he demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his beloved only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do not doubt, only believe. Of course, that's Paul's message, isn't it? Uh, all through his, his writings, all through his letters, that's the message through the Gospels, only believe. We ought to put that in big, bold letters and keep it out in front of us, especially on those days that we find that the world is kind of crashing in on top of our heads, only believe. Put our trust in him. Thank you all for praying for uh, our sweet little Ron. Talked to her just a little bit ago via FaceTime. She looks fine. She looks good. 
Uh, she's kind of still, you know, kind of low key, but uh, uh, doing well. Uh, they're checking. There's a, apparently a little gap in, in her throat by the esophagus. They're going to see what needs to be done with that. And they're running some biopsies and different things that, uh, uh, so, you know, just continue to pray while they go through that process. But uh, she's home and she certainly looked good this morning. All right. It's good to see everybody out there. Boy, what a group we had. What a crowd we had yesterday. Just what a blessing! Had a had, didn't notice until I got to the end and had posted, and and apparently uh, the screen hadn't scrolled up, and there was a young man by the name of Raphael. Raphael Taylor that came on board, and if he's out there this morning, I want you to notice, I notice that, you know, thank you, uh, God bless, it's good to have you among our family, so you know, everybody give Raphael a shout out, but uh, uh, don't know, hope he signs in this morning, at any rate, uh, Miss Ruth, good morning to you, and say hi to Kenneth, if you would, it's good to see you up there, first thing out today, too, with Miss Donna right behind you, good morning, Donna, and buddy, Julia, God bless Bless. We love you. I don't know how things are. It's cloudy here. By the way, guess what? It, it, it may surprise all of you. We may get rain today. Surprise, surprise, surprise. At any rate, uh, it is uh, uh, that time, but it's a little cloudy, We're, we, so we, we, we may, but uh, uh, hope things are warm and nice. By the way, thanks for letting me know yesterday that... Uh, 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 Charles Stanley had passed away. Oh, so blessed by the tributes to him out there yesterday as uh, Facebook kept popping up with different tributes from different people. Carolyn, good morning to you. It is good to see you this morning and pray all is well in your world. Miss Sue, good morning to you. My dear, dear friend, Debbie says, good morning, everyone. Are we blessed to have this time together? What an all-sufficient God we serve. And I got to amen that, Debbie, and amen and amen. And Terry, Terry, good morning to you. There's my Miss Sherry. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. Jessica and Betsy. And you know what this means. Kisses to my little Sadie, all right? Cynthia Ryan, good morning to you. Pray you are feeling well today and doing well. I, Miss Laura, I just got off the phone from talking with you. God bless you. Miss Lena, I see you and Rick up there this morning. God bless. Love to see you up there. Teresa, too, if she's out there, she may be at work, but uh, shout out to her. Alyssa, good morning. Kara and Cody are happy that Cece is finished for the year. Yay! I saw they got a party or something next week, or one of them, other groups do. We're happy to see you all today. I, well, you know, I, I I think school ought to go you know a lot longer than it does. I know I'm going to get a boo, Kara, Cam, Cody. I get a boo out of you. I may understand that, but uh, uh, you know, yeah, face it, you have fun. I know I've been down there enough to know that you have fun. So. I can't think it's a big drudgery. You have fun. But that means that we get to see all of you. And uh, we love you. You're such a special family. God bless. And again, Rick, give you a shout out. Hello, hello. At any rate, shall we get launched in and get going uh, as the team, the gang, yay, yay, is all, they're not finished with mom's school yet. Ah, ah yay. <laughs> And they're going, boo! At any rate, yesterday we wrapped up Chapter 5, attempting to tie all those little loose ends together. Good morning, Teresa! Uh, to all those loose ends together and put the various pieces uh, uh, and, and see how they all fit together. There are four miracles in uh, Mark 4, 35, all the way through uh, Mark uh, 5, 43, uh, that answer the question that is asked in verse 41 of Chapter 4, after Jesus calms the storm after that first miracle. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, who he is, he's the one who has the power over the wind and the sea. He's the one that has the power over the oppression of the enemy and uh, over the unseen forces of the evil one. He's the one who had power over the disease and, and sickness and, and, and any form of a, a infirmity. He's the one that even has power over death. He is the resurrection and the life. That's who he is. Almighty, sovereign God. 
Uh, now we come to chapter six. We just really kind of opened it up a bit yesterday uh, and and get us this whole new episode in Christ's life. Uh, in, in chapter six, verse one through 13, there are two paragraphs that fit together in a really, really interesting way. Uh, the first one, we see Jesus rejected by uh, his hometown folk there in Nazareth. And then later on, you know, right after that, uh, we see Jesus telling the disciples to prepare uh, for rejection themselves. He's getting ready to send them out two by two, and we'll be looking at that. So we began, of course, with the rejection of Jesus in Nazareth. And we, we find this opening scene uh, in verses one and two. It says, and Jesus went out from there uh, Capernaum and came into his hometown about 20 miles or so away and the disciples followed him and when the Sabbath came he began to teach in the synagogue and many listeners were astonished saying where did this man get these things and what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands now they're asking I think the wrong questions but uh We'll get to that. Uh, notice that they didn't ask Jesus these questions. Uh, they asked each other. They began, uh, you know, it says they were astonished and were saying, you know, to each other. They're not saying, who are you? We're, you know, we knew you as, and, uh, you know, where do you get the power to do or the wisdom to do? That's not what they're asking. They're asking each other. They'd rather hear the opinion of their peers than truth from the Word of God. Now, unfortunately, we kind of sometimes fit in that category. We're much more interested in the opinion of man than the opinion of God. And as I said to a group of pastors one time, you know, I don't think God is all that interested in my opinion or your opinion. The opinion that most interests him is his, because his opinion is always right. It's not an opinion. It is the truth. Uh, you know, oftentimes I will have people come in, you know, and sit down, we want to talk and they've got a problem. And uh, as soon as I reach to open the Bible, they say, no, no, I don't, I, I don't want you to throw the Bible at me. I don't, you know, I, I want to know what you think I ought to do. What they're saying is I want your opinion. You tell me what you think. I don't, you know, really want to hear what, what the Bible says or anything. Just tell me what, what I ought to do. Uh, well, I got to tell you, uh, the only solid advice any of us could give anybody else better be couched or founded uh, standing on the, the, the solid rock of the Word of God. Uh, there was a time uh, to question the speaker at every synagogue service, but they ignored that and preferred uh, uh, the supposition of others over truth. Uh, this is pure subjectivity. And is that not the way we live today? subjectively, not objectively, on truth? Isn't that kind of the, the mantra of our culture, uh, perception over reality? Uh, how else can you get the kind of uh, things that we have now where we're identifying gender, you know, and, and, you know, one person put 116 genders out there. I, you know, how else do you get there other than ignoring reality and taking perception? What we feel, what we think, by far exceeds what God has to say. So ignore the source of truth, even when it's standing right in front of you. Uh, that's a good definition of insanity, in my opinion. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can come before you today. We can come to your word. We can open it. We can allow you, Lord, to, to enlighten us and, uh, and to teach us by your Holy Spirit. You have put your spirit inside each one who has ever come to you, that, Lord, that's, that, that the Spirit of God might reveal to us the very deep things upon the heart of God. As Daniel says, Lord, you reveal to us the very depths, the, the, the unknown things about you. And that's what we need to know. We need to know those things that you have given for us to know and understand. Lord, we need to uh, uh, relish and, 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 and rejoice in the fact that we, we, we understand and we know you, the one and only true living God who spared not even his own son, 
but gave him as an offering to redeem a fallen, rebellion, rebellious mankind. God will love you. And I pray, Lord, that you'll give us insight and wisdom. Teach us, Lord, even, even some things that we, we've not known before or refresh what we've known but, but have left neglected. We come asking you, Lord, to give us the courage to take your word and, 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 and to re receive it in such a way it becomes engrafted in our very heart. Teach us, reproof us, correct us, train us, Lord, that we'll be perfectly, thoroughly furnished for every good work that you've given us to do. To you be praise and to you be glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, anyway. any rate, are we ready? Let's get going. There are the first two questions uh, that are asked attack the very source and the quality of his wisdom. What do they say? Where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom given to him? Now, they were left with only two sources. Only, only two places that, that the, the kind of things that he's saying and the wisdom that he's got could come from. It's either come from God or it's come from Satan. It's either uh, man, you know, Satan inspired through man or it's, it, it's God inspired. Uh, they're too subjective to accept the fact that God is the source of this man's teaching. So their unspoken conclusion is, is this guy's got to be of the devil. And that, that's what leads to their actions. This is the conclusion of the Jewish leaders, is it not? Back in, in chapter 3, verse 22, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he's possessed of Beelzebub? And, they, and he cast out demons by the ruler of the demons? Isn't that the conclusion that they came to? They just couldn't accept that this is of God. Uh, second, they were questioning the very source uh, of his words and, and, and his miracles. You know, you go back and, and take a look at that again. It says, and, and, and such miracles as these performed by his hands. Uh, by that they meant, you know, it, it can't be of divine origin. You see, in their minds, it, it just, there was no possibility that could be. It's not that they denied that miracles took place through Christ or that he said the things that baffled all the religious leaders of the day, but they questioned the very source of his wisdom and his power. Where did he get the power to do these miracles? Now, we know that he didn't do many miracles. He did some, but not many in fact, uh, I think it's Mar uh, Luke that says he did not many mighty miracles you know, in there. He didn't do many. He did some. Mark tells us that, that there was a few people that were healed, but not many. You see, so they're probably referring to what they have heard had been done in Capernaum about 20 miles away and in the region, in the area. And This is the last time we're going to have Jesus recorded as teaching in the synagogue in Mark's gospel. Doesn't mean that he didn't. I'm saying it's the last time it's recorded that he taught in the synagogue in Mark's gospel. The reference may be that Jesus was now finding it restrictive to teach in the synagogues and that he chose rather to be in the open country where people came to him to receive both teaching and healing. Listen, this, isn't, this may be the first time, but it's certainly not the last time in history that this sort of thing happens. Uh, Wesley, when he began preaching in the, and, and, and he was uh, invited out of the Anglican church, you know, you, know, you can't preach in our, our churches. He went out into the, the fields outside of town and the people would come out of the towns to the field and he would begin to, to proclaim and to preach to them in the fields. The same thing happened to, uh, to Whitfield and it happened to Edwards. And, you know, uh, when, when, uh, with Edwards, when, when the buildings wouldn't hold the people, they went out in the open air market and uh, you know, in the fields outside of town and the, and the crowds would gather and he would preach to them. So it, it may be the first time, but it isn't the last time in history. Uh, you know, sometimes 
you if, if the word is rejected here you got to take it where it's not i when i was in india when i was in nalur i preached in uh, in in a rather high high church setting there one day and uh, man it was cold and sterile and absolutely nothing happened and i i questioned you know god why have you got me here and I was missing my family terribly. I hadn't had any contact with it. It wasn't like now where you do FaceTime and uh, and Messenger and all of these kind of things. And uh, uh, you know, I, I was desperate. I was I was frightened. You know, because. Uh, uh, there were a lot of folks in the area that didn't want the gospel preached and they had come in uh, and was uh, creating some stir in the area and uh, you know I, I was just hungry for fellowship and somebody in it about midnight you know uh, the lights go out all the all the power turned off about 10 11 o'clock at night midnight sitting there in the dark you know praying you know desperate God sent me two people uh, the young, the interpreter of the young catechist that worked, uh, yeah, and no cell phones. That's right. And we had no contact while I was there. Was well, in fact, I wrote her a letter and sent her a letter. It got to us. It got to her six months after I got home. But at any rate, uh, that was then. Certainly not now. Uh, at any rate, uh, we prayed through the night. The next night, uh, I preached in a, a really rundown area of, of the town in a tiny little building uh, uh, that uh, uh, wasn't much all. It was just basically an open room. And God blessed. He began to pour people in and pour people in. They couldn't hold them, and they spread out and, and out, out into the streets and uh, into the vacant lots and stuff. They had loudspeakers set up, and God just moved in an incredible way. So here we have Jesus, you know, you know, He's got to go to the people now. He's got to go out into the countryside. The, here's the next thing that they ask in 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 verse three: Is this is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother James and Josie, Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. Now, as the questions continue, we find that the people of Nazareth are also questioning the very person of Jesus Christ, or his nature, his being. Note the question, is not this the carpenter? Now, we don't think too much of it, but this is a remarkable expression, and it's only found here in Mark's Gospel. This is one of those places that you'll only read it, you'll only find it there. Now, it had to impress Peter greatly to pass this on to, to, to Mark. So we need to delve into it. It shows us plainly that for the first 30 years of his life, our Lord was not ashamed to work with his hands. He wasn't ashamed to get blisters and calluses on his hand. He wasn't afraid of a little sweat and a little dirt. And there's something overwhelming to me in that thought. And I think it probably overwhelmed Peter just a little bit because Peter had seen him. Peter had seen him, you know, Jesus was a hard, hard worker. I mean, when you consider the fact that, that you know, j just take for the fact that, that he preaches he, he preaches to a large crowd, he heals, he teaches, he heals, he teaches, you know, all day long. It's an exhausting thing, people. I, but I want you to consider something. Please, just, just wrap your mind around this. This very thought, is not this the carpenter? Well, it's a definite article, the carpenter. In fact, you, you, yeah. he, he who made the heaven and earth, made the seas and all the dwell therein, he without whom nothing was made that was made, according to John, the very Son of God, who himself took on the form of a servant. Now, get the picture of the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all-powerful God of the universe, of cre creator of heaven and earth, El Elyon, who did not matter to him that he stooped and in the sweat of his face ate his bread as a working man. My friends, this is indeed that love of Christ that passes all knowledge. Though he was rich, 
yet he became poor for your sake and for my sake, that you and that I might be made rich in his grace and his mercy and his glory, both in life and in death. Jesus, the very God of gods, humbled himself. Didn't think you could get that much out of five little words, did you? But it's all there. Pull back and look at the splendor and the wonder and the glory. Of it. And, and, and does it or, 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 or can it at least at some point leave you just a little awestruck? The hands that formed and fashioned man out of the dust of the ground and breathed life and made him a living soul, those hands chiseled and carved stone and build walls and, and hewed wood. The one who breathed life into us, that same breath would be breathed out in exhaustion at the end of a hard work's day. The word carpenter in the Greek is, is tecton. And it actually means a craftsman who builds. Now, given that Israel's buildings were constructed mostly of stone and rock, it's quite likely that Jesus worked as a stonemason rather than what we typically think of a carpenter. When we think of a carpenter, we think of somebody that's working in wood and putting up cabinets or, or structures or you know doing the frame outs and all of these kind of things. But he was probably uh, much more a stonemason than he was a wood uh, worker, though he certainly worked in wood as well. But consider the fact that uh, there's a difference between working with rock and working with wood. He probably spent hours helping his father, Joseph, Gune and, and, and Strip go out into the you know into the countryside because you know the Masons would do that. The 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 car and they would they would, would chisel the blocks of rock out and put them on and they'd pull those wagons with uh, uh, if they had a donkey that would help, but you know, they would get them back home and there where they were building they would they would chisel those pieces of rock to fit. Stone to fit. Oh, it, it gives me goosebumps to think that we are living stones. Think of what it goes into a a, uh, a stonemason to uh, uh, to form and shape and and to build something out of stone. We we think about it today because we've got brick ovens and we make brick and uh, they're all one size. And when I get ready to put a retaining wall out here, I'll go get block and it's all going to be the same size. But when you're talking about making a stone, you know, a, 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 a building out of stone, each rock has to be honed and chiseled to fit perfectly next to the other rocks and stones. I've used the illustration sometimes uh, when uh, we're talking about the fact that we are living stones uh, in a spiritual building. Years ago when they were building, uh, you know, century and a half ago when they were building St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, uh, a man was standing there watching them build and, and it was almost completed in the upper spire. And there was a, a man standing there and he had, he had a stone. He chiseled away and then he'd look at a spyglass and uh, then he come back, he chiseled some more, he look at his spy guy. And the guy said, sir, what are you doing? So he answered him. He said, here, take a look, you know, at, at what you see through the glass. And he looked and he saw this opening up at the top of the spire, right, right up at the top. And he said, do you see that opening? He said, yeah. He said, well, this rock is going to fit in here. And he said, I'm shaping the rock here. So when I get it there, it fits perfectly. My friends... That's such a beautiful illustration of what God is doing in your life and mine. He's shaping us here, chiseling off the stuff that doesn't look like him and doesn't fit by him. He's, he's shaping us here as living stones so that we fit when we get there. So that we're fit for what he's doing in us now. He would have built anything probably from a plow 
to a house, a piece of furniture, to a wall. He was a skilled, skilled craftsman. It's also very physically demanding work. I agree with you. Terry, that's my favorite theological word, wow. It, 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 it's so powerful you'd say it backwards. It means the same thing. It was a noble, noble profession. But understand this. Is not this the carpenter? He was of the labor class. He was a blue-collar worker. You say, so? Big deal. Well, it was then. In the ancient cultures, it wasn't like here in America where you could start in the warehouse and work your way up to the corporate office. My brother started at, at, at the company he worked for for all of his life. He started on a line and worked himself up to uh, to that middle management point where he's in charge of the whole production of the whole, uh, he worked for course for the whole brewery for one whole shift. I didn't know it like that then. It just didn't work that way. Your advancement had to do with your heritage, with your bloodline, with your, uh, uh, with your family connections, the family you were born into, not your skills and your ability. So if you were labor class, you were labor class. You would never be anything other than that. If you were upper class, you would always be upper class, even if you were a, 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 a low-class individual, uh, morality-wise, you would still be upper class. It's just the way it stayed. And by the way, the reason this is important, this little sentence, is not this the carpenter? Rabbis did not come from the labor class. Rabbis came only from the upper class. Go back. A miracle. Jarius was of the upper class, which should make this even more compelling to us when you see the upper class bowing at the feet of this lowborn, low-class rabbi. I could go wild to that one too. So at first they're astonished by Jesus' teaching, but then they back away and they say, wait a minute, uh, this guy is just a carpenter. Not only was he a carpenter, but he was a carpenter from where? Nazareth. It was an inconspicuous little know-nothing town with no trade routes or governmental uh, uh, establishments in town. Outside the town, they've discovered a, a huge edifice that, you know, in archaeology they found it was the summer palace of Herod called Zipporah. And because Zipporah was there, Nazareth had, was as a little outpost, military outpost. It was, a, it was a, a soldier's town, wild and reckless and dirty. That was Nazareth. Just a dust pot of a, you know, don't blink twice when you go through town. A one, uh, you know, maybe as much as a one, we call, we call some places a no-stop sign town and some a, you know, one-stop sign town. Daniel, da, na, Daniel expresses the, the common man's understanding, the city dweller's understanding of Nazareth in John 1 and 46 when Nathaniel said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Really? And Philip says, come and see. So they considered that since he was one of their own, they're from Nazareth, he could not possibly be what he claimed to be in his teaching. Lowborn, oh, and there's more reasons behind it that we're going to get to. Working man, just a working stiff with, with no real formal education. He didn't go to rabbinic school. He didn't sit at the feet of Gamaliel. He wasn't of the learned class. How could he be anything more than a lowly carpenter from an obscure, obscure little town? And then comes 
maybe even a, a greater blow. Is not this the carpenter? What's the next thing? The son of Mary. What you think about that one for a moment? You see, you and I will look at that and, and we'll feel some gratified. Well, we revere Mary. Now, we don't uh, worship Mary, uh, but we do honor her and revere her among women, don't we? Absolutely. This would have been no big deal to us for one, someone to say, this is Mary's son. But go back to the ancient world, go back to the first century, go back to Nazareth, and you need to understand this would have been a very derogatory statement. They would refer to someone according to who that person's father was. You don't think so? Take a look at Scripture. James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And I could, I could list so many other examples. You don't find anyone that I can think of in my mind. You know, Boaz, the son of Salmon. Now, his mother, Naomi, may have been mentioned in there, but the son of Salmon. And, and on and on, you'll find that throughout Scripture. Even if the father is dead, he would be referred to as the son of or the daughter of. It was proper to refer to Jesus as Yeshua, the son of Joseph, the son of Joseph. To call him the son of Mary would have been a statement of derision, an incredibly negative statement. Here's how the thought pattern would go. You remember Mary and Joseph were betrothed? When she suddenly showed up pregnant, Joseph became aware of that. He knew he didn't have sexual relationships with her, so obviously she had been unfaithful. So he sought to divorce her. The angel appeared to Joseph and said, don't divorce her. She hasn't been unfaithful. She's still a virgin. She's with child through the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine explaining that one to your friends and family? Really? We've never been intimate? And she just got pregnant by God, the Holy Spirit? You suppose most of the townsfolk jumped on board and said, Yay, we understand this. We believe you. Nazareth is a rural Jewish community with probably less than 300 people living in it. Ever lived in a small town? Anybody? Ever live in a small town? Sherry grew up in some really small towns. She graduated from Burlington in 1969. There were 69 in her graduating class. Take it back. 67. There were 67 in her graduating class. Ever been in a small town? Everybody knows everybody's business? And nobody ever forgets everybody's business? So the rumor throughout Nazareth was Jesus grew up, was that Jesus was an illegitimate child of Mary, and frankly, they didn't know who the father was, so they couldn't refer to him as, yeah, me, town of 40, yeah, Bethune, town of 40. So the rumor was that uh, he was illegitimate, child of Mary, don't know who the father is, so we're not going to call him Yeshua, son of Yosef. We'll call him, in this Mary's son? All of that is captured in that statement. He is the son of Mary. The illegitimate son of Mary. Questions about the personage of Jesus began very early in his ministry. 
So the biblical writers made it very clear that Jesus was God in flesh. That's why every one of the Gospels, every one of the historic accounts of Jesus emphasizes the deity of Jesus Christ as well as his humanity. And they bring that hypostatic union to the forefront constantly. John writes, and in three letters to support that, and a gospel. Do you understand now something of the significance of what is happening there in Nazareth? John opens his gospel by declaring Jesus Christ to be God of creation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Luke often spoke of Jesus as the Son of God. Matthew and Mark tell us about the transfiguration and the divine appropriation concerning Christ, the Son of God. Mark exclusively, Jesus uses the term the Son of Man to refer to him in Daniel's perspective as the Messiah. Jesus is constantly putting himself forth. There is no question, God, when he says, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Paul especially deals with Christ's nature in Colossians and in Galatians. In Colossians, declaring all things have been created through him and for him and by him. In the epistle of the Hebrews, the writer explains that he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. Think about it. In other words, to have seen Jesus was to see God in flesh, who exactly corresponds with the revelation of God in his being, and who also demonstrates his omnipotence in sustaining the world. I'm going to have to stop here because uh, time, church history is replete with those who deny the personage of Jesus Christ, making him an exalted human, perhaps, but not deity. I'll bring some of those up to you uh, tomorrow as we, we open up. Monarchianism and, 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 and others, all the way down to one of the largest worldwide religions that there is, which is Islam. You can go to those who knock on your door day in and day out throughout, you know, trying to earn their way into the kingdom. Who deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And here in Nazareth, we see this an open display, open disdain for who Jesus is by those who watched him grow up. I know we only got through a couple of phrases, but do you see how significant those couple of phrases is? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Father, I thank you for the blessing and the outpouring and the, the power behind your word. We thank you for the intimate, incredible detail given to us. When we look at the Gospels and we put them together, we see one whole composite. God, let us exalt your Son to that preeminent position as co-equal with the Father. Let us know that when we get into these pages and we see Jesus, that we're seeing the Father. We're seeing God in his totality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We may not comprehend it completely, but we can grasp it by faith and with understanding given to us by the Holy Spirit. Let us revere you, honor you, worship you, live in humble submission before the Sovereign the ancient of days, the God who is the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever. And Lord, 
let that flow from our life and touch the lives of others. May that be the wellspring from which you will bubble up through us, out of us, and over us. May we live in worship today, Father. May we be just the opposite of those in the synagogue in Nazareth that day. To you be the hallelujah and the amen and the glory forever, Lord. Bless us this day as we go forward in the name of Jesus under his divine authority. We pray amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor, for the hard work you do to bring us the complete truth about our God. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Raphael, people continue to reject Jesus as in the time of Noah. Yes, they do. Raphael, it is good to meet you. It is good to have you there. You all give a shout out to Raphael. I, I didn't notice you yesterday until I signed off. I'm glad I get to see you out there today. May God bless you, young man. And thank you for that word. They do. And uh, that's okay. When you share Christ and they reject that, that's all right. You've planted a seed, folks. They're not rejecting you. Uh, one of the reasons people don't witness as, as uh, fervently as they ought to is they're afraid of rejection. Understand, they're not rejecting you. They may be rejecting the message you bring, but most likely what they're doing is they're rejecting Christ, just like they did in Nazareth that day. But that's okay. Go on sowing seed. Go on planting, because in due time, you will harvest. Thank you for coming to the study. Thank you for being part of this today. And I pray God has just blessed you and that you can go out and become a blessing to others. Love one another, please. Keep that before each other. When when things get, and, and, and we, we, we want to, you know, get harsh, remember, love is of God, comes from him. He is love. Love one another. By this, everybody's going to know you're his disciple. You have loved one for the other. God bless you. See you tonight at 6 o'clock as we continue our study with, with Christ in the Old Testament back in, in, in Psalm. Uh, we love you. God bless you. Have a great day. And I'll see you again tomorrow, too, at 9 o'clock in the morning. God bless.